I am Ryan McKnight. I'm Kara Santa Maria. I am Christopher Smith. Hi, I'm Andrew Torres. This, this is Naked Mormonism. Mormonism, the Serial Mormon History Podcast. Today's episode is part two of reading through The Entheogenic Origins of Mormonism, a Working Hypothesis. Part one constructed an overview of psychedelics in various occult and esoteric practices, the Smith family's proficiency with manipulating various plant medicines, Joseph Smith's fascination with ritualistic practices, which often included entheogens, as well as a framework for a few candidate entheogens, including Amanita muscaria mushrooms, ergot fungi, and datura. Part two begins with various magical mentors of Joseph Smith, including Lumen Walters, who, after his brief affiliation with Mormonism, made his living from selling plants and herbs as medicine, gaining the label of eclectic physician and surgeon while operating his apothecary storefront. That section transitions into the many other botanical physicians Smith surrounded himself with throughout his ministry, including Frederick G. Williams, Willard Richards, and John C. Bennett. The remainder of the paper dives deep into candidate entheogens, their psychoactive profiles, their effects, symptoms, and internally perceived effects. That basis of information is used to transition into the first vision experience of Joseph Smith in the early 1820s, and also what can be understood from his self-reported theophany when viewed through the psychedelic lens. This portion we're reading on today's podcast ends with the long-lasting and therapeutic effects of entheogens and why they may have had a certain appeal to Joseph Smith in light of his upbringing and childhood trauma. Of course, you'll find a link to the entire paper in the show notes if you'd like to read along or read it for yourself. So with permission from the Journal of Psychedelic Studies and the other authors of the paper, let's get started. Lumen Walters, Occultist and Eclectic Physician. Mormon scholar and historian Michael Quinn, 1998, reviewed the historical record about Lumen Walters, 1789 through 1860, who was an accomplished physician, preacher, and magician. Through his travels and scientific training in France, Germany, and Italy, Walters became an quote-unquote eclectic physician, whose practices involved occult techniques that included the administration of medicinal herbs he processed in his well-stocked laboratory. Walters was an exceptionally qualified mentor. During Joseph Smith's teen years and early 20s, Walters utilized his occult training as an astrologer and seer for treasure companies, one of which was a fraternity of rodsmen with Joseph Sr. as one of the leading members. During this period, Walters was young Joseph's constant companion and bosom friend, and given Smith's extraordinary level of intelligence, he readily received Walters' teachings and eventually exceeded his skills as a conjurer and scryer. See Abner Cole, 1831. Esoteric Practice Walters used a seer stone, conjuration, animal sacrifice, and likely a hallucinogen to occasion, quote, interview with the spirit supposed to have custody of a particular hidden treasure, end quote. It was Walters who, quote, first suggested to Joseph the idea of finding a book, end quote. Occasionally, Walters could be found reading to a receptive audience from an old book in a language that only he could understand and prophesied that Joseph Sr., quote, was about to find a history of hidden treasures and a record of the former inhabitants of America, end quote. Joseph Jr. was chosen as a treasure seer by the same company that had hired Walters, leaving him angry and resentful. Residents believed Walters' mantle fell on the young Joseph. While acting as a seer for this company, Smith announced that he had found golden plates containing a history of Amerindian ancestors, from which he subsequently, quote-unquote, translated the Book of Mormon. Smith used a seer stone to translate, and we hypothesize, an entheogen. The use of the latter is suggested by reports of his frequent intoxication or altered appearance while translating. Lumen Walters and Joseph reconciled because Walters was later reported to be a disciple of Joseph Smith in Kirtland, Ohio, suggesting Walters' direct impact on Mormon visionary experience could extend into the early Kirtland period at least. Walters likely received his esoteric training, including alchemical drug expertise while studying in Europe, see below. The esoteric physician's involvement in Mormonism was confirmed by Brigham Young, one of Joseph Smith's successors. Joseph Smith's alchemical Masonic amulet suggests Walter's drug alchemical influence in Smith's early career. 
see below. Medical Practice Walter's medical practice fared much better than his seership duties. He secured his medical reputation by curing a child of severe croup after traditional physicians had in despair given up. Croup was the, quote, common term for every affection of the windpipe, end quote, strider that produced a high-pitched crowing sound on exhalation. Porter, from 1826, notes that antiphlogistics, anti-inflammatories, were used by all physicians of that period, as were opium and atropa belladonna and datura stramonium, both of which contain hallucinogenic anticholinergic alkaloids. Operating his laboratory, Walters could isolate the active anticholinergic compound of the datura plant as an extract or tincture. He would know the appropriate doses to treat respiratory diseases such as asthma, cough variant asthma, and to relieve pain from sciatica, menstruation, and cancer. Datura was well known and, quote, Indeed, so closely does it resemble belladonna that even in the intoxication which it produces, the same follies are committed, end quote. The effects of this plant are well known in some parts of Europe, and the plant was vulgarly called Herbe oxsorceries from Thompson, 1832, and was, quote, commonly connected with witchcraft, death, and horror, end quote. Walters undoubtedly used anticholinergics such as Atropa belladonna, Deuterum stramonium, and Hyoscamus niger as treatments and knew of their use as visionary substances. He may have also known the antidepressant properties of anticholinergic facilitated experiences and used these medicines to treat melancholy. Further suggesting that Walters prescribed psychoactives is a statement in the following report in the Geneva, New York Times. Quote, in the olden days, roots, herbs, and vegetables were considered highly essential as medicine for nervous disorders by a number of physicians. Among the early physicians to use these ingredients in his prescriptions for nervous disorders was Dr. Lumen Walters, a noted physician and surgeon who practiced in the village of Gorham over half a century ago, end quote. Walters would have brought from Europe the medical and occult books from which he taught and perhaps loaned to the Smiths. Anyone with access to the Magus, such as Walters and the Smiths did, would read recipes describing hallucinogenic anticholinergics or herbs of the spirit that could be smoked, used orally, dermally, or intravaginally. Ceremonial magicians in both Europe and America used visionary substances. Dale Pendell notes that included in John Porta's book Natural Magic, published in 1558, quote, A number of recipes, both for sleeping potions and madness potions, using Datura stramonium, belladonna, and henbane. Natural Magic was an immediate bestseller, end quote. Weiris includes nightshade in his visionary formula. Although nightshade can be a generic term for members of the Solanacea family, including the Solanum genus of food plants, such as tomato, potato, and eggplant. It could also be a term for highly toxic, bittersweet Solanum dulcamera, or woody nightshade, with purple and yellow flowers and red ovoid berries. Frederick G. Williams, Apothecary One early convert to Mormonism living in Kirtland was a second-generation German immigrant named Frederick G. Williams. Born in October 1787, Williams took up the practice of medicine around 1816 after the death of his sister-in-law during childbirth. Williams gravitated toward Thompsonian medicine and was frequently called an herbal or vegetable doctor. However, Williams did not limit his practice to herbal medicine. His skill set included setting fractured bones, suturing wounds, and treating burns, cholera, venereal disease, and delivering newborns. If Williams followed Samuel Thompson's 1841 Materia Medica, which was in its 13th edition, he would have given enemas to assist with childbirth and, if needed, given a tea consisting of raspberry leaves and number two, the latter signifying the class of medicinal stimulants found in London and Edinburgh dis dispensatories. Since 1822, ergot of rye was thought, quote, to be the most efficacious remedy in cases of protracted labor and excessive hemorrhage, end quote. And by 1838 was, quote, available in every dispensary in London, end quote. Favoring herbs himself, Smith had great sympathy for this branch of medical practice. Soon after his induction into the religion, Smith appointed Williams to the office of second counselor to the prophet, Smith's scribe and printer for church publications. 
As a physician, Williams was, quote, universally known through this country as an eminent and skillful man, end quote, saving Samuel Smith's wife in childbearing and reviving the newborn child. Fellow physicians living in Nauvoo used ergot in the obstetrical practices, and we have no reason to believe that Williams' skills were any different. Indian Mission One aspect of Williams' involvement in early Mormonism was his mission journey to proselyte to the Native Americans from late 1830 to 1831. Joseph Smith revealed to Oliver Cowdery and three other elders they were to commence their missionary efforts to the Lamanites, as Smith called Native Americans, Indians, and scout the location for a satellite stake or congregation to be organized in Missouri. During this journey, the missionaries met Williams and he joined the group to meet with and proselytize to the natives near modern Kansas City, Missouri, in a native settlement known as Caw Township. For a botanically-centric physician, an opportunity to meet with the so-called Lamanites and intermingle knowledge of herbcraft and mysticism with the people who had been using American plants for millennia would have been an exciting prospect. Dr. Williams' medical practice later reflects this newfound knowledge of, quote, Indian medicine, end quote, as evidenced by multiple advertisements Williams published in the Quincy Whig from 1839 to 1842. The overwhelming logistical constraints of supplying scores or hundreds of Mormons on multiple occasions with various plant medicines could have been satisfied by an experienced Thomsonian botanical physician like Frederick G. Williams with his herbarium. As evidence of their close fraternity, Joseph Smith named one of his children after Frederick G. Williams. Smith had a strong and previously unremarked tendency to draw physicians close to him and place them in positions of close confidence. Smith began his career as a seer with botanical physician Lumen Walters as his mentor, and later made Frederick Williams one of his top two or three confidants. In the early 1830s, Smith ordained him his counselor in the newly organized First Presidency. In the early 1840s, he made physician Willard Richards an apostle and his private secretary. Also around the same time, he made physician John Cook Bennett a counselor in the First Presidency and arguably his right-hand man and closest companion in the early 1840s. Let's, uh, let's take a minute to break this down, okay? The influence of John C. Bennett and Willard Richards on Joseph Smith in Nauvoo is quite notable. I, however, take a particular interest in Frederick G. Williams. We've discussed him a bit on this show. We've devoted an entire episode to just Williams when he passed away from our timeline. But not only was he an herbal physician with an herbarium on either side of his house, as noted by Eber D. Howe in Mormonism Unveiled, but he was also one of the earliest converts to the church. He was a counselor in the First Presidency, one of the first missionaries. The Kirtland Temple was built partially on his land, and he was Joseph Smith's personal scribe who penned at nearly 100 of Joseph Smith's Kirtland revelations. You see, Frederick G. Williams was always next to Joseph Smith throughout the majority of his ministry. Also, when Joseph Smith moved to Kirtland in early 1831, Frederick G. Williams split his time between the Kirtland headquarters and Zion in Missouri. Due to being absent, somebody had to keep running his herbarium in Kirtland, and Joseph Sr. was given the job. Senior continued to control the herbarium for most of the time that they lived in Kirtland until the mass exodus to Missouri in 1838. So why is Frederick G. Williams so paramount to the Smith entheogen theory? He seems like the guy. You see, if Joseph Smith was facilitating visionary and mystical experiences using psychedelics, he alone could have scavenged or cultivated the necessary plants in the earliest days of the church when their membership was only a few dozen people. However, as the church grew, so did Smith's daily duties and the time required to scavenge the forest for or to personally cultivate enough plant materials would have grown pretty thin. Smith needed a regular supplier who could provide entheogenic materials year round. So, Frederick G. Williams, who owned greenhouses on his farm right next to the temple, was immediately elevated to the second highest governing body in the church, and then Joseph Sr. takes over the greenhouse operation. You see, Williams and Joseph Sr. had the know-how, and Williams had the land to provide the necessary plant medicines— and Joseph Sr. in the early Kirtland church suddenly had access to nearly limitless supply of ecstatic and spiritual experiences. 
And nobody would dispute that of the visionary era of Joseph Smith Mormonism, Kirtland was the most visionary, where these crazy phenomena make the most frequent and incredible appearances. And Smith seemed to have yet to learn that these practices are better conducted in secret, as was clearly noted in his timeline through Nauvoo. Also worth noting, Williams and his wife, Rebecca, were incessant record keepers. Williams' ledger books, while they don't provide his recipes or his standard practices, they reveal a small window into what services and products he provided to the Mormons. So in addition to sewing up Hiram Smith's arm after a wood chopping accident, Williams provided medicine for all sorts of maladies. Notably, one of his products, of which he seems to have sold a lot in Nauvoo, was called Bachelor's Delight. What Bachelor's Delight was is up for speculation because he didn't include the recipe, but a few different classes of plant medicine could fit the criteria and would have come particularly in handy for Nauvoo polygamy. It could have been as simple as a pain cure for venereal disease, or it could have been an aphrodisiac or an abortifacient, or it could be used to render a person's sober faculties and inhibitions or... <laughs> memory loss completely effective. So I'll let you, the dear listener, consider the purposes for those drugs in the context of polygamy. All of that said, Frederick G. Williams certainly is a crucial piece to the Smith entheogen theory, but it should also be noted that he wasn't the only herbal physician in Mormon leadership and certainly not in the wide and like the wider common membership of the church. Williams' age took a toll on him, and he died as soon after the exodus from Missouri to Nauvoo. By that time, Joseph Smith had other botanical physicians in his closest circle, including Willard Richards and John C. Bennett, who's long been the focus of accusations concerning abortions in Nauvoo, especially because Bennett owned a brothel in the city before the Mormons gathered together as a mob, and they were fed up with him, and they tossed his brothel into a ditch. For roughly 20 months, Joseph Smith and John C. Bennett were inseparable and even shared the same Nauvoo home for over a year, taking meals together, attending meetings together, preaching from the same pulpits, and riding around town in the same carriages together. Whether it was John Bennett, Willard Richards, Frederick G. Williams, or one of the Whitmers, Joseph Smith always had an herbal physician within arm's reach. Let's continue. Entheogenic Materials the availability of entheogenic material to the Smith family and their ability to process and utilize it are foundational to our thesis of an entheogenic early Mormonism. Sources of entheogens available to the Smith family and other herbalists interested in divination, visions, and spiritual ecstasies included Datura stramonium, Anamita muscaria variation Gusoi, Psilocybe ovidia cystidiata, and Claviceps purpurea. Moreover, with established trade networks extending into southwestern Texas, Joseph Smith potentially had access to two additional entheogens, Lophophora williamsi and Incilius alvarius, Datura stramonium and Hyaskyamus niger. Two prominent members of the Solanacea plant family were available in the areas of the Smith family, domiciled Datura stramonium, Jimson weed or Jamestown weed, and Hyaskyamus niger, black henbane. The Drug Enforcement Administration reports Datura plants growing wild as ornamentals and in herbal gardens throughout much of the United States, from the northeastern states to Texas, and the USDA plant database shows both Datura stramonium and Hyaskymus niger growing in extensive areas across the entire northeastern states and other areas in the country. Both plants contain the tropane alkaloid deliriants atropine, hyoscyamine, and scopolamine, and are among the oldest medicines known to humankind. Physicians used them since antiquity as effective medicinals in Eurasia and early post-colonial America. Datura, for example, was used for its analgesic, antispasmodic, anti-inflammatory, and anti-helmintic properties. Antithetically, 19th century clinicians reported successfully treating a case of chronic delusional state with a 10-day course of carefully prescribed Datura stramonium. Magico religious practitioners also used hyoscyamine and scopolamine since antiquity, primarily to facilitate visions and ecstasies during divinatory and shamanic healing ceremonies, religious rituals, and witchcraft. 
Anticholinergics were also used as an anesthetic by the Greek physician Pediacus Dioscorides and noted by the Roman encyclopedist Aulus Celsus. In the earliest attempts at general anesthesia, wine extractions of the bark of the root mandrake and the seeds of opium and henbane were used to cause dead sleep so the patient would not apprehend the pain of surgery. The properties of datura are also well known among colonials living in the 18th century Boston. During the 1676 rebellion by Virginia settlers, quote, hungry British soldiers consumed the plant and then hallucinated for 11 days, end quote. The same symptomology will return in 1830-31, to 31, Kirtland. Psilocybe ovoidea cystidiata mushrooms range from Rhode Island to Kentucky and is especially common in the Ohio River Valley. These mushrooms are usually harvested from April to mid-June, but sometimes persist into late September or early November and have farinaceous or flower-like taste, possibly making ground-up mushroom concealable in bread. Psilocybin-containing mushrooms have different pharmacology than Amanita muscaria and are historically a major entheogen in cultures worldwide. When ingested, psilocybin content of these mushrooms is dephosphorylated into the psychoactive compound psilocin, explaining why these fungi, quote, have been exploited for the psychotropic effects since prehistoric times, end quote. Psilocybe species mushrooms are best known for their entheogenic use in pre-Columbian Mexico, where they were used at least the last 2,000 years. Psilocybe mushroom use extends back to 6,000 BCE in Europe and 7,000 BCE in Africa. Amanita muscaria variant Gessoe mushrooms, such as the one shown growing near Kirtland, Ohio in Figure 16, are widely distributed in the woodlands and forests of northeastern America, where it is recognizable by its yellow to yellow-orange cap with remnants of the universal veil forming white scales and a skirt about its stem. It fruits in enormous quantities, often attaining a dinner plate size, and can be found growing in a circle or fairy ring around its host tree. The fairy ring can be striking in appearance, especially as the mushroom matures and takes on a golden color, enhanced by the early morning or evening light. The cap contains ibotenic acid and muscimol, with more hallucinogenic and less toxic muscimol content increasing as the mushroom dries. Amanita muscaria may be the oldest entheogen known, with some believing its use began after the, quote, last ice age in northern Eurasia forest belt and spread north following the retreating polar ice cap approximately 11,000 BCE, end quote. And used as an entheogen by Siberian shaman for millennia. Further, Indo-European speaking groups developed a vocabulary pertaining to its shamanic use, followed centuries later by the priests of the Vedic culture who sang hymns in praise of Soma the god, the sacred plant and the sacred drink pressed from the plant. It appears from the 2nd to 9th century CE among, quote, Buddhist adepts who have been ingesting this mushroom, end quote, as an entheogen. Amanita muscaria use appears in alchemy, Christianity, and among free and adept masons. We argue that it appears in the dreams and visions of the Joseph Smith family. Claviceps purpurea, ergot and mushroom. The physicians, Lumen Walters, Frederick G. Williams, and John C. Bennett, see below, may have provided Joseph Smith with visionary ergot. In figure 17, soft white sphacelia tissue is producing a sugary or honey-tasting honeydew. The darkly colored sclerotium in figure 18 when mature drops to the ground. When there is moisture, ergot on the ground germinates, forming mushroom-like fruiting bodies, stromas, with stips and heads of various colors in figure 19. The non-water-soluble ergopeptine alkaloids, quote, were the agents responsible for the recurring plagues of ergotism known throughout European history, end quote. The same alkaloids were used by physicians since the 16th century to stimulate uterine contraction to hasten childbirth, to stop postpartum hemorrhage, or to induce abortion. Use of ergot for these purposes included 1840s Nauvoo, Illinois, where it was available to Mormon physicians. William Shelley argues that ergot use as an entheogen can be, quote, traced through the Greco-Roman world, through the worship of Mithra and the Hebrew scriptures into the activities of early Christians, and from there to the hidden tradition of alchemy, end quote. Water-soluble psychoactive alkaloids from Claviceps purpurea, ergot, 
include ergonavine and methyl ergonavine. These alkaloids are believed to constitute the Kaikion elixir of the great Eleusinian mysteries. Peter Webster argues that, quote, Greek priests could easily have harvested enough ergot, 0.5 kilograms, from the nearby barley fields to serve 1,000 Eleusis participants, end quote. Continuing, quote, Hierophantic priests might well have discovered how to achieve partial hydrolysis of the most toxic alkaloids of claviceps purpurea, resulting in an extract of ergot containing a blend of psychedelics, eliminating the toxic ergopeptine alkaloids, converting them to psychoactive ergine and isoergine, closely similar to the Aztec's ololioqui. End quote. The life cycle of ergot lends itself to allegory in esoteric Judeo-Christian as it does in spiritual alchemy and masonry. For instance, the manna which Moses said came from the heaven tastes, quote, like wafers made with honey, end quote, a description consistent with ergot's honeydew stage. While undetected ergot infects bread and causes disease, water-soluble alkaloids can be added to bread, making it an entheogenic Hebrew sacrament. Consistent with entheogenic use of ergot, Moses tells the tribes of Israel that manna is, quote, the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat, end quote. See Exodus chapter 16, verse 15. A theme echoed in the Christian era when Jesus says, here is the bread of life. Figure 20 shows a frame from the circa 1200 Great Canterbury Psalter in Canterbury, England, titled God Creates Plants showing God with four mushroom-appearing figures below him. All five figures have uplifted hands, seeming to mirror each other. This medieval Psalter reveals esoteric Christianity's fascination with entheogenic mushrooms. In this figure, God appears to wear an Amanita muscaria cap showing its gill side down, while the leftmost figure appears to be a stylized psilocybe mushroom, and the far right figure appears to represent the stromata of an ergot fungus sclerotium. The dark purplish sclerotium in figure 18 that has replaced a grain of rye will remain dormant for an extended time if harvested or fall to the ground. The grounded sclerotium will eventually be moistened by rain or irrigation and produce stroma resembling tiny mushrooms in figure 19, while figure 21 is an enlargement of the stroma, showing its yellowish-red stipled head, comparable to the head of the rightmost mushroom figure in the Psalter frame. A Mason and early Mormon convert, John C. Bennett, was a practicing physician and obstetrician. There is circumstantial evidence that Bennett, accused of ministering quote-unquote medicine to induce abortion, was familiar with the medical uses of ergot. Lumen Walters or Frederick G. Williams likely had the education and practical training to cultivate, harvest, and prepare the psychoactive materials associated with ergot for the Kirtland Temple. Bennett would have been qualified to safely prepare visionary ergot as a ceremonial entheogen in the Nauvoo Temple. Lofofora Williamsi, Peyote during the period of Indian removal beginning in 1830, Native Americans living east of the Mississippi River passed through Nauvoo on their way to their seasonal hunting grounds. Potawatomi delegations also often included members of the Fox and Sauk Nations, visited Joseph Smith between April 18th and August 28th of 1843, discussed below. The purpose of these negotiations is not altogether clear to historians. However, as we will see, the negotiations probably involved Joseph Smith giving valuable and sacred property to the Potawatomi without apparent gain to Smith in return. We suggest that Joseph Smith may have negotiated with Native Americans for the delivery of peyote to Nauvoo for the Nauvoo Temple Endowment. Peyote, La Fofora Williamsi, in figure 22, grows along the Mexican-Texas border and has been used in Native American magical religious ceremonies for millennia. Quote, Indians regard the peyote as a panacea in medicine, a source of inspiration. Moreover, it is the key which opens to him all the glories of another world. End quote. In Aboriginal time, the peyote cult was among the udo aztecan tribes, and perhaps even earlier in the Mesoamerican and Greater Southwest cultural super-areas, and among tribes adjacent to those of the United States, Pima, Opata, Jumano, Luganero, and Coahuilteco. The diffusion of peyoteism northeastward occurred in stages beginning in the, quote, Old Peyote Complex, end quote, of Mexico, before the Spaniards arrived in the 16th century, eventually culminating in the Plains Indian Peyote religion in the late 19th century. 
The map in figure 23 shows the location of the peyote beds, dark gray, and the Indian tribes, light gray, who are practicing peyoteism before 1800. When Joseph Smith sent Lyman White to Texas to establish Mormon colonies, he would have been in contact with both the source of peyote and Native Americans expert in its use. After the Spaniards took control of what is now Mexico in 1571, peyote cults were suppressed by priests of the Catholic Inquisition, who nearly eradicated peyote rituals. An Inquisition document of 1620 outlines Catholic opposition to the ancient Amerindian religion and its peyote sacrament. Quote, Peyote has been introduced into these provinces for the purpose of detecting thefts, of divining other happenings, and of foretelling future events. It is an act of superstition, condemned, as opposed to the purity and integrity of our holy Catholic faith. The fantasies suggest the intervention of the devil, the real authority of this vice. End quote. Peyote cult's recovery first took place among the Huichol, discussed below, and the Terahumara tribes. Peyote use among Moscaleros and Lipan Apache likely had its origin in the late 18th century with, quote, the Apache making one ritual complex from features selected from the totality of the Mexican and Spanish religious and ceremonial life they knew, end quote. Also, Akehult Kranz argued that there are, quote, reasons to assume that Mexican tribal peyote ritualism constituted the transition to the Plains peyote rite and thereby the modern peyote religion, end quote, with intermediates being the Comanche, Kiowa, and Kiowa Apache. Further, there is evidence of peyote use by Lipan Apache in the 1770s. It would be naive to believe that Plains Indians shaman, medicine men, or doctors would not have been interested in peyote long before the establishment of peyote religion. Why would Joseph Smith be interested in peyote that requires an overland journey of 1,300 miles through Missouri, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Indian Territory before arriving in the peyote fields? We suggest that Smith heard of, quote, aspects of peyoteism, end quote, and its visionary properties as information made its way east until in 1835 there were, quote, European peyote cactus fanciers, end quote. Typifying Native Americans' feelings about peyote, Comanchero War Chief Quana Parker spoke once of the advantage peyote offered Native American religion over those in the United States. Quote, the white man goes into his church house and talks about Jesus, but the Indian goes into his teepee and talks to Jesus. And the Indians received their inspiration from the Great Father, while the white man received his through the book they have. End quote. Joseph Smith, who had promised converts visions of God, would have been naturally interested in the ceremonial use of peyote for Mormon rituals. Below we discuss evidence he sought to obtain peyote. Incilius Alvarius, Sonoran Desert Toad One of the most dramatic religious experiences found in the Tree of Life dream accounts reported by Joseph Sr. and recorded in the Book of Mormon by Joseph Smith Jr. may be facilitated by smoking parotid gland secretions of the Sonoran Desert Toad. In Cilius Alvarius, shown in figure 24 and found in the same general area as peyote, according to Little Goldstein and Garts of 1996, quote, Bufo toad and related genera has held a place in humanity's archaic consciousness since time immemorial. The earliest presentations of bufo toads and toads generally go back thousands of years. The appearance of toad-based artifacts is prehistoric were portrayed in ancient pictographs, paintings, and sculpture. End quote. Secretions harvested from the parotid glands of Incilius alvarius are rich in highly entheogenic 5-MeO-DMT. Evidence suggests that 5-MeO-DMT harvested from Incilius alvarius was an entheogen used by the Olmec, Mayan, and especially the Aztec civilizations where, quote, Aztec icons focus in great detail on the bufo toad's parotid glands, which contain substances that may be trance-inducing, end quote. The Incilius alvarius in figure 24 bears a striking resemblance to pre-Columbian stone toad effigies, such as the toad effigy with the Mayan sun god carved on its back from northern Guatemala or southeastern Mexico in figure 26, and the stone pipe toad effigy from the Ohio Hopewell culture in figure 27. Early critics of Mormonism linked magical toads with Joseph Smith. For instance, a neighbor of the Smiths, Willard Chase, reported in 1827, Joseph Smith's father related the following story. 
Quote, Some years ago, a spirit had appeared to Joseph, his son, in a vision, and informed him that in a certain place there was a record on plates of gold, and that he must repair to the place where was deposited this manuscript. Joseph Smith repaired to the place, opened the box, and in it saw the book and something like a toad. End quote. The subsequent transformation of the toad described by Chase strongly suggests an entheogenic source for this vision. Further, in 1830, the year Joseph Smith finished his translation of the Plates of Gold, his occult mentor, Lumen Walters, reportedly possessed a stuffed toad, a common familiar of a conjurer. Walters, who traveled in Europe, would have known the toad's magical and possibly hallucinogenic properties. According to Little et al. from 1996, the more, quote, purely psychedelic applications of the bufo toad had to do with the so-called toad stone supposedly found in the head parodic gland of the bufo toad. In 1644, Franz Boutius de Boot, in his Parfait Joyalier, Perfect Jeweler, described the toad stone alleged to exist in the toad's head, another sure talisman for obtaining perfect earthly happiness, end quote. The twice-mentioned toad during the production of the Book of Mormon suggests the remote possibility that Smith employed a toad entheogen in his writing. Further, the happiness mentioned by Botius de Boot is a significant sequel of many early visions in Mormonism discussed below. For Joseph Smith to have used toad 5-MeO-DMT, it would have been smoked or snuffed. Further, Incilius alvarius entheogen would have had to be transported from southwest Texas along existing Indian trade routes into the American Northeast. Peyote, found in Texas, see figure 25, retains its potency, roughly 2% mescaline, over thousands of years, while 5-MeO-DMT retains its potency over a much shorter period. Although no literature indicated how long and at what temperatures 5-MeO-DMT remains active, if it is like its cousin, NN-dimethyltryptamine, its salts retain their potency significantly longer than when kept in solution. Presuming this entheogen remained active between harvesting, arrival in the Midwest, and use, a stuffed toad with 5-MeO-DMT could easily supply the needs of a magician or seer for a prolonged period or a small congregation of believers for a year. Further, 5-MeO-DMT would be an attractive entheogen for Joseph Smith due to its immediate and profound antidepressant properties. Had Joseph Smith known the features of entheogenic toad venom, he would have undoubtedly arranged for its procurement and transport to Nauvoo in the 1840s. Further, in 1844, Joseph Smith instructed fellow Mormons to settle the region surrounding the Rio Grande River. One follower, Lyman White, referenced below, went to Midwestern Texas to form the Mormon colony of Zodiac, a site within easy traveling distance to both the Peyote Beds and the Sonoran Desert Toad Catchment Area. Figure 25 also shows the area where the distribution of Lafalfara Williamsi, peyote, and Native American expertise in peyote sacraments and medicine overlapped with the proposed Mormon territory. All right, so let's summarize what we just discussed very briefly. These are our four candidate, primary candidate entheogens in the Smith entheogen theory. Now, look, we, we can demonstrate access to most of them, and people moved around America and traded objects and commodities with surprising speed in the 19th century. So when I was introducing this paper in last week's episode, I said that we we're taking a bit of a shotgun approach, right? This is where that shotgun approach comes into play. We have our shining candidate entheogens of Datura and Amanita muscaria. Those would be really our best arguments. However, with this paper, we're trying to put forward more good arguments instead of fewer best arguments. For example, the Sonoran Desert Toad is pretty tough to actually demonstrate that Smith could possibly have had access to it beyond maybe Lumen Walters having a stuffed toad when he was Smith's mentor and the possibility of the spirit guardian of the plate starting as a toad which transformed into an angel and then threw Smith a few rods from the location of the entombed plates. So there can be no mistake that Lumen Walters had a heavy influence on Joseph Smith at this time, and he represents the primary candidate for occult instructor who would have educated Smith on the occult uses of entheogens. The Sonoran Desert Toad obviously demonstrating a path of possession from where they actually grow in the Sonoran Desert Toad to Joseph Smith in Nauvoo is much, much harder to actually, well, demonstrate, right? 
So this is primarily where the hexing herbs or the witching ointments come into play. Datura, henbane, mandrake, hemlock. Most of these are nightshades, but they all fall under the category of witching ointments or hexing herbs for their frequent implementation in esoteric practices. The occult philosophers of the day, Ebenezer Sibley, Francis Barrett, Henry Cornelius Agrippa, all of these writers devoted extensive portions of their occult books to the use of herbs, all of which included something about these very specific plants with very specific psychoactive profiles. They could be smoked to aid in conjuration, prophecy, divination, spirit communication, and all of these esoteric arts. They could be infused in a topical ointment for healings or for astral projection, inserted into the anus or vagina to fly through the celestial spheres unknown to uninitiated eyes. You see, these plants were tools to see a world our mortal eyes can't comprehend. Let's talk briefly about peyote as well. I mean, peyote has a fascinating history in European American culture. It was harvested and sold all across the nation throughout the majority of the 19th century and before as well, largely via indigenous tribes. And it has a fascinating medicinal profile with very few negative external symptoms, both during the dosage effectiveness time space and after the dosage. And peyote likely only made its appearance in Smith's psychoactive toolbox near the very end of his life as his meetings with Native Americans became more frequent from 1841 to 44. He also commissioned various missionaries to make their way to Texas to scope out a location for a new Mormon settlement on the Rio Grande, which is the only place in America the peyote cactus grows. We talk about Lyman White, but roll back that a little bit, Lucian Woodworth returned from his mission with intelligence and a larger settlement expedition was planned at Smith's direction. And that's when he tasked Lyman White with the task of finding a new Mormon settlement near the Rio Grande. Smith died in June of 1844 before Lyman White could carry out the mission. But Lyman White still created the Mormon settlement just barely north of San Antonio on the Pedernales River, which was only a week's long journey to ride down to the Rio Grande, harvest peyote buns, and return to Zodiac, which could then supply the other Mormon settlements via the Pedernales River to the Colorado River and over land transport from that point. Now, we have no documentation stating explicitly that White's mission to Texas had the intention of creating a peyote highway. Maybe the document exists, maybe not. But the location and the timing of Lyman White's settlement mission sure present an interesting prospect when viewed through the Smith Antheogen lens. And it's also very notable that Joseph Smith's grandson, Frederick M. Smith, who was prophet of the RLDS Church from 1915 to 1945, wrote his doctoral thesis on ecstatic and spiritual experiences, which included an entire chapter on peyote. We'll discuss it at the end of the paper, but the, uh, he was also a relatively frequent user of peyote, the psychedelic peyote, throughout his entire life. But of course, that's getting a bit ahead of the story because we flesh all of that out near the conclusion and the the later timeline of the of the paper in part three of this podcast series on it. So let's continue and get there when we get there, I guess. Shamanic transformation. We have discussed mentors for Joseph Smith, which we believe knew entheogens and employed them in his mentoring. Overwhelming childhood trauma suffered by Joseph Smith facilitated his formation as a shaman prophet of a successful new religion, enabling the use of entheogens to their maximum religious potential. Unimaginable Childhood Trauma Grosbeck, a Jungian-trained psychiatrist, has argued that the shamanic healer archetype aptly describes Joseph Smith's personality structure. Grosbeck, who studied with a Weichol shaman, agreed with Mircea Eliad that the shaman's role and function depended on their techniques of facilitating ecstasy. According to Eliad, the shamanic healer's abilities in ecstasy or trance to enter, quote, into contact with divine or semi-divine beings and to consort with the dead with impunity, end quote, generally resulted from severe trauma during early life. This shamanic complex and its archetypal pattern result from a severe illness early in life and strenuous ordeals. Joseph endured such an ordeal at age seven when stricken with life and limb threatening osteomyelitis secondary to typhoid fever. In a horrific and prolonged ordeal, the young Joseph Smith suffered multiple exquisitely painful surgical procedures without the benefit of anesthesia or sedation. 
One might get a sense of what this seven-year-old boy must have endured in a revealing revelation. Quote, I, God, command you to repent, lest I smite you, and your sufferings be sore. How sore you know not, how exquisite you know not, yea, how hard to bear you know not. End quote. The appalling nature of young Joseph's surgeries, documented by physician Leroy Worthlin, is incomprehensible except to those who have experienced them. William Moraine, a surgeon with a Mormon background, describes how the terror of such painful surgical assaults creates dissociative injuries within a child's developing brain that become, quote, an integral part of the psyche that can permeate all corners of his mind forever, end quote. However, severe childhood trauma does not explain Smith's ability to facilitate en masse visionary experience and does not explain the anticholinergic symptoms associated with his own early visions and many early convert visions reported to have occurred between 1830 and 1831 as discussed below. Joseph Smith Jr.'s Visions Joseph Smith Jr. had visionary experiences in his spiritual quests that display several specific features. Analysis of these accounts and the features of his experience provide data to support the hypothesis he deliberately employed entheogenic substances. 1820, the first vision. At 14 or 15 years of age, Joseph Smith Jr. embarked on a spiritual quest. Like the alchemical philosophers before him, one object of his quest was wisdom. Joseph Smith's later revelation, The Word of Wisdom, reflects the view that taking the proper things into one's body, avoiding addictants, and using every herb in the season thereof would enable the seeker to find wisdom and great treasures of knowledge, even hidden treasures. See Doctrine and Covenants, section 89. Before he went into the grove in 1820 or 1821 to obtain wisdom, already three powerful precedents directed Joseph to seek wisdom through what he ate. First, he had a prototype for his quest in the story of Adam and Eve, who acquired wisdom by what they ate. Next, the search for wisdom had also been modeled for him by the Christian alchemists and Freemasons, who sought wisdom through the Philosopher's Stone, the Bible's White Stone, and by partaking of the elixir, the hidden manna of the Book of Revelation, which also promised that to him that overcometh the gift to eat of the tree of life. Also, finally, the quest for wisdom was more immediately modeled for the young Joseph by the elder Joseph, his father, who had been instructed through prophetic dreams how he could gain wisdom. Here again, the model was that one could acquire wisdom by what one ate. Joseph Smith's spiritual quest is a continuation of his father's, a quest for Christ's primitive church for temporal and spiritual salvation and wisdom. Joseph Jr. reported that a quest for wisdom was his motivation for going to a grove of trees where, at the age of 15, he experienced his first vision. In what Lucy Mack Smith similarly called Joseph Smith Sr.'s first vision, Joseph Sr. began a quest for wisdom and forgiveness of sins by journeying into a fallen wood. He was told, eat, of a certain edible materials he found on a fallen tree and informed, quote, this will make you wise and give unto you wisdom and understanding, end quote. It would be remarkable if the younger Joseph's quest for wisdom were not informed by his visions of his father. Joseph Jr. should, therefore, have expected that to obtain wisdom, he would also need to eat something provided by God. However, where would he acquire the necessary antheogenic foods? Here again, his father's vision showed the way. Joseph Jr. sought his visionary experience in the clearing in early spring, the precise time when plants would be sprouting and entheogenic mushrooms could begin to be harvested amid the dead timber. Joseph, a firm believer in providence, saw divine purposes in nature's provisions of various herbs and perceived God's hand in all things, the minute details of life. See Doctrine and Covenants, section 59, section 8, section 9. After seeking a physical landscape for his own first vision quest for wisdom that actualized the dreamscape of his father's first vision wisdom quest, what did Joseph intend to do when he arrived if not to follow the commandment given to his father in his vision to obtain wisdom? Against the backdrop of the biblical Adam and Eve story, the Masonic biblical promises of hidden manna, and the visionary commandment to his father to acquire wisdom by eating what God placed on the dead timber— Joseph Jr. was primed 
to perceive entheogenic plants and mushrooms at the culminating moment of his search for wisdom as a providence auguring that he needed to eat to obtain wisdom and of what he needed to eat to become wise. Another potential clue to what Joseph Jr. needed to eat to gain wisdom was the biblical description of it as the hidden manna. The original biblical manna appearing in the story of Moses' exodus was described in Joseph's King James Bible as round edible objects found on the ground in the morning. See Exodus chapter 16. If Smith expected the hidden manna to take a similar form, he would have found obvious candidates all around him in the spot where he sought wisdom, growing on the hidden or under the fallen trees of his father's clearing. Early in the spring morning, Joseph Jr. knelt under a canopy of oaks, birch, and hemlock to petition God's forgiveness of his sins. The accounts of the ensuing vision compiled by Mormon writer Eldon Watson reveal the problematic mentation and peripheral symptoms secondary to the onset of what Burkhart identifies as anticholinergic hallucinogen intoxication. At the onset of his theophany, Joseph, cited in Watson, 1983, reported he, quote, saw all kinds of improper pictures, was seized upon by some power which entirely overcame him, was blinded as thick darkness gathered around him, his tongue cleaved to the roof of his mouth so that he could not speak. He heard a noise behind him like someone walking towards him. He sprang upon his feet and looked around but saw no person, was ready to sink into despair and abandon himself to destruction, not to an imaginary ruin, but to the power of some actual being from the unseen world with such marvelous power as I had never felt in any being. End quote. Anticholinergic Toxodrome had Joseph been taken to a local physician of the period during the initial phase of intoxication, the diagnosis of poisoning with a member of the Solanacea family, such as black henbane or Datura stramonium, would have easily been made. Similar clinical features can also present with poisoning the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Ibotenic acid, pantherine and agarine, and muscimol are among the active components of Amanita muscaria, substances that with powerful effects on the central nervous system. Although tropanic alkaloids are not present, the signs and symptoms of poisoning with the fly agaric are called mycoatropinic, and they resemble those produced by Datura stramonium, Atropobelladina, and Hyoscyamus niger. The symptoms Smith experienced related to those of the anticholinergic or mycoatropinic toxidrome were hypertension and hyperthermia, agitated hallucinations, delirium and strange mental states, slurred speech, tremors, coma, and occasionally seizures, tachycardia and dysrhythmias, dry and flushed skin, especially the face, dilated pupils, mydriasis, and blurred vision and dry mouth. These symptoms constitute one of five basic toxidromes. Features of the anticholinergic toxidrome in Joseph's accounts of his first vision include being rendered blind as a bat, mydriasis, blurred vision, mad as a hatter, altered mental status, delusional paranoia and hallucinations, and dry as a bone, dry mucous membranes, and a duration of intoxication lasting several hours or more. Paralysis associated with Dertura stramonium is also reported. Young Joseph either understood the sublethal visionary dose or was lucky, since coma and death may ensue in severe poisonings of Datura stramonium and Amanita muscaria. From Eldon Watson's 1983 textual harmony of Joseph Smith's first vision, we learn that just as Joseph was anticipating ego dissolution and imminent death, a, quote, Light appeared to gradually descending towards him until he was surrounded by a brilliant light, creating a peculiar sensation throughout his whole system and causing his mind to be caught away from the natural objects with which he was surrounded, and he was enwrapped in a heavenly vision. End quote. In the vision, Joseph's profound sense of guilt was assuaged, as an angel appeared, the Lord, and assured him that his sins were forgiven. Then, quote, when I came to myself again, Joseph explained, I found myself lying on my back, looking up into heaven without any strength, but with a mind in a state of calmness and peace indescribable. Joseph added, My soul was filled with love, and for many days I could rejoice with great joy, and the Lord was with me. End quote. Table 1 compares the relationship between Smith's symptomatology and those of the anticholinergic syndrome. 
Joseph Jr.'s description of his first vision is profoundly personal and unlikely to have been manufactured due to embarrassing symptoms diagnostic of anticholinergic intoxication he later attempted to hide or contextualize. Further confirming that Joseph was in a visibly physically altered condition after his initial recovery from the visionary state, he reports that upon his re-entry into his family home, his mother asked him, What is the matter? Similar symptoms also appeared during Mormon convert visionary experience when Joseph Smith founded his church in 1830, referenced below. The positive symptoms associated with Joseph's vision also suggest the known antidepressant effects of scopolamine from Deuterostromonium or black henbane, or possibly muscomol from Amanita muscaria. Scopolamine, quote, produces rapid and significant symptom improvement in patients with depression, end quote, similar to the afterglow phenomenon of classic entheogens. A feature of Smith's first vision experience that cries out for explanation is its stark tangibility and experienced veridicality. He emerged from his experience of the demonic and the divine, convinced of the actuality of the beings he had encountered. Quote, but exerting all my powers to call upon God to deliver me out of the power of this enemy which had seized upon me, and at the very moment when I was ready to sink into despair and abandon myself to destruction, not to an imaginary ruin, but to the power of some actual being from the unseen world who had such a marvelous power as I had never before felt in any being, I had actually seen a light in the midst of that light. I saw two personages, and they did, in reality, speak to me. End quote. Smith either found himself bounded by an actual being and then actually saw a light, or there were neurophysiological changes in his brain and body that facilitated their perception. Even if Smith is understood to have encountered external spiritual forces, one would have to explain what physiological changes facilitated his ability to physically engage with entities that cannot usually be seen or felt. Entheogenic Deuterostromonium explains how Joseph Smith perceived his engagement with spiritual forces as an actual physical encounter. A high dose of psilocybin would have provided the mind-opening, cosmological, transformative, and disintegrating and reintegrating aspects of the experience, while Deuterostromonium would have given the experience of another reality, initially in the grips of a terrifyingly physically real evil being. Unbeknownst to Joseph Smith, as for the mythical Adam and Eve, eating the forbidden fruit entailed an experience of evil in tangible form, Satan or the serpent, to obtain wisdom, that is to experience the deepest abyss besides commune with God. Smith also acted the part of an alchemist transmuting or transfiguring his physical state to enable himself to find wisdom through the visionary experience of both good and evil, Satan and God. It is also possible that Joseph Smith used Psilocybe ovoideocystidiata or another species of psilocybin-containing mushroom, although this is less likely than an anticholinergic entheogen based solely on the symptomology. We mention the possibility of Psilocybe ovoideocystidiata here because this mushroom can be found from Rhode Island to Kentucky and is especially prevalent in the Ohio River Valley where it grows on wood debris, especially along rivers, streams, and wet valley areas such as the Sacred Grove. The Sacred Grove hosts a great variety of fungi, besides Amanita muscaria, due to it residing in a small valley of seasonally wet and cooler terrain. On two visits to the Sacred Grove before the conception of an entheogenic origins of Mormonism, one author, Robert Beckstead, found abundant mushrooms of several varieties, including one in figure 28, the photographed mushroom in the sacred grove appears suspiciously like psilocybe species mushrooms in figure 29. Unfortunately, no field testing for the typical blue reaction to pressure was conducted. Okay, very, very brief pause. We're going to talk a lot about the Kirtland Temple dedication ceremony as being like the entheogenic crux of Joseph Smith's ministry, but we can't ignore the signals present in his self-reported visionary experiences. For anybody who's had an ego dissolution level of entheogenic experience, they can certainly empathize with what Smith reported as happening during his vision experience. Now, many people will argue about what he actually saw during the vision, as the reported spirit conjurations vary from account to account to account over time. 
It initially appears as an angel, then legion of angels, then the face of God, then God the Father and Jesus Christ in separate corporeal form. These details are incidental when viewed in the larger context of hallucinatory experiences as the physiological symptoms are relatively consistent throughout and most detailed in the latest account. Smith claimed he was physically pinned by a being. His tongue was stuck to the roof of his mouth. His vision was blurred. A pillar of white light descended upon him. He woke up lying on his back and enfeebled by the experience, but was filled with everlasting joy. All of these are very common symptoms of witching ointment intoxication. Every detail of his account can be explained by him eating detura seeds or some red-capped mushrooms, which grew prolifically in that area of New England and still do to this day. <laughs> well, like the, the, the types of plants that grow don't really change in an area over a 180-year period. So then the question is, like, did the first vision happen in 1820, 1821, 1823? Did he see angels? Did he see God or did he see God and Jesus? These questions only matter within the belief system and historical narrative of the correlated church's claims. Frankly, when viewing these claims and the historical discrepancies through an entheogenic lens, none of those questions really matter because the two points of consistency throughout the various accounts are the time of year, the autumnal equinox, and the self-reported symptoms, which perfectly match anticholinergic toxidrome or symptomology. What's more, entheogen use can help to explain the discrepancies in the self-reported vision. What I mean by that is like entheogenic hallucinations are inherently squishy and hard to remember, but they leave a truly remarkable impact on the mind of the user. The term ineffability is best to describe what is perceived when proper dose set and setting variables are adhered to because the experiences defy description. Words don't suffice. Smith clearly had a life-changing experience, what we might call theophany, entheogen, theophany, in that grove. When he tried to describe it to your questioners years after the fact— the details of that vision became blurry and timelines became vague while the gravity of the experience still retained its weight throughout his entire life. So here's an exercise. Here's some homework for you listeners. Ask anybody to describe their trip immediately after it happens. And I can almost guarantee you that they won't have words. Ask them a year later. They might have figured some thing out um, it may have some kind of weird words to try and describe it but still words are going to escape them ask them 20 years down the road and they'll remember how profound the experience was but they're really going to struggle to remember any details and even find words 20 years later to describe what their experience was Few people have ever been able to apply words to these incredible experiences. And what I would re recommend to you listeners is watch a lecture or a media appearance by Terrence McKenna. Now, he uses incredibly loaded spiritual language to describe the experiences, and his voice has kind of a, an interesting ability to lull the viewer into a trance. But Few other people have I ever seen or read such profound and accurate descriptions of these experiences, which completely transcend religious creeds and simplistic biblical terminology that confined Joseph Smith when he was relating his experiences to different people at different times in his life. Let's continue. Entheogenic Replication of Smith's First Vision Many examples of entheogenic experiences are reported in peer-reviewed literature and on the internet that bear a striking similarity to those of Joseph Smith. For example, religious historian Houston Smith's initiation into ultimate reality was occasioned by a psilocybin-containing mushroom. Houston reports, quote, What the day accomplished was to enable me for the first time to experience the respective levels of the chain of being all the way to its top. The dominant effects of the experience were two, awe, which I had known conceptually as the distinctive religious emotion, but had never experienced before so intensely, and certainty. There was no doubt that the reality I experienced was ultimate. That conviction has remained, end quote. In the same year, 1961, Houston ingested peyote cactus and reported, quote, 
I noted mounting tension in my body that turned into tremors in my legs. I began experiencing the clear, unbroken light. I was now seeing with the force of the sun in comparison with which everyday experience reveals only flickering shadows in a dim cavern. I saw worlds within worlds, end quote. Houston Smith concluded that using entheogenic substances can occasion an experience with a form indistinguishable from those of experiences of religious mystics. Heinrich, from 2002, ingested Amanita muscaria as the entheogenic facilitator and reported, quote, I felt like I weighed thousands of pounds and could no longer sit up. In a great darkness and great silence, the heavens opened above my head. The bliss I had experienced prior to this new revelation now paled to insignificance in an immensity of light that was also the purest love. The absolute profundity of the experience cannot be denied. Neither can be adequately expressed, though one is moved to try. End quote. Houston's and Heinrich's entheogenic reports reveal the core features of Smith's earlier vision, an experience of physical heaviness, visual darkness, an awe-inspiring light from above, a voice out of heaven, experience with the unfathomable Godhead and feelings of unspeakable joy. Joseph Smith's Actual First Vision his actual first vision and a vision of a divining instrument, a seer stone, initiated Joseph Smith's career as a visionary scryer. Mormon historians connected his seer stone vision in which Smith saw a small stone which became luminous and dazzled his eyes, and after a short time it became as intense as midday sun, with his theophanic first vision, linking the visions conceptually and placing them in roughly the same time frame. Smith's understanding of his white seer stone as the white stone of Revelation chapter 2 verse 17 also connects it with the white stone of Hiram Abiff and therefore the hidden manna mentioned in the Masonic degrees and thought to have been administered in the more esoteric versions of those degrees. It was from underneath the acacia sprig, believed to be an entheogenic symbol in Masonic lore, that Hiram Abiff's remains and quote-unquote jewel were reportedly excavated. Conflating jewel and white stone, Smith may have conceived of Hiram Abiff's body and white stone being recovered together from under the tree. The acacia marking the burial site of Hiram Abiff's body and a jewel is understood in Freemasonry as a tree of life, referenced below. Joseph Smith reported excavating under a tree to find his white seer stone, recalling the excavation of Hiram's white stone under the acacia's tree. After recovering this stone, Joseph Smith placed it into the darkness of his hat, looked into it, and discovered that he had acquired one of the attributes of deity, an all-seeing eye, reflecting another probable occasion on which he ate from an entheogenic plant. Joseph Smith, eating from such tree of life, anticipated the Book of Mormon's descriptions of an entheogenic tree of life, discussed below. 1823 Indian Visions Joseph Smith's next vision in 1823 is notable for the post-vision weakness and its ancestral Amerindian content. The many ancestral Amerindian tumuli found and excavated in New York and Ohio undoubtedly fascinated the young Joseph, as did the widely held belief that Amerindians were the remnants of lost tribes of Israel. However, as he had three years previously, Joseph's vision was preceded by fervently asking forgiveness of his sins. When the vision opened, a brilliant light appeared, and in the light Joseph claimed that he saw an angel identified as an ancestral Amerindian, with whom he spent the entire night. Quote, I discovered a light appearing until the room was lighter than at noonday, when immediately a personage appeared appeared at my bedside, standing in the air. His whole person was glorious beyond description, and his countenance truly like lightning. The room was exceedingly light. When I first looked upon him, I was afraid, and he said there was a book deposited, written upon gold plates, giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent." End quote. Following these visions, Joseph arose to work on the family farm, but on meeting his father in the field, quote, found his strength so exhausted as to render him entirely unable to labor, end quote. Psychedelics in the Book of Mormon Several lines of evidence in the Book of Mormon suggest Joseph Smith's awareness of psychedelics and their effects. 
The Book of Mormon functioned as sacred scripture and acted as a psychopomp for early Mormon converts seeking direct and personal experience with God under the influence of entheogenic material. Consistent with this view, Mormon Jungian psychiatrist Grosbeck argues for the Book of Mormon as symbolic history. We suggest that passages in the Book of Mormon and other early Mormon sacred writings guide spiritual experiences as outlined by Leary, Metzner, and Alpert, 1964, in discussing the Tibetan Book of the Dead, to establish a setting for predisposing early Mormon converts to direct and personal experience with God through spiritual ecstasies. Another aspect of the set and setting of early Mormon visionary experience is Joseph Smith himself as the archetypal shaman. Leary et al., 1964, emphasized the need for, quote, a trusted person to remind and refresh the memory of the voyager during the experience, end quote. Smith was that trusted person. Herbs, although not frequently mentioned in the Book of Mormon, are highly endorsed as medicines explicitly and entheogenic substances implicitly. For instance, the Book of Mormon speaks of the, quote, excellent qualities of the many plants and roots which God had prepared to remove the cause of diseases, end quote. We argue here that Smith, in the Book of Mormon, intended to reference not only the treatment of bodily diseases, but also the maladies of the soul. While traditional herbs may be useful for treating ailments relating to the body, it is the entheogenic herbs that lift the mood and relieve despair, as demonstrated after partaking of unusual fruit described in Joseph Sr.'s entheogenic dream discussed above and in the Book of Mormon Tree of Life allegory discussed below. Also in the Book of Mormon, Smith associates the use of herbs with symptomology such as death-like experience lasting days rather than hours. Symptoms resulting in sensations of tongue swelling, sensations of motions, taste of light, enlightenment, and a mood elevation. These symptoms, in our view, demonstrate that Smith encoded his entheogenic knowledge in the Book of Mormon. Death and Rebirth Symbology Ego Death Mormon historian Don Bradley interprets that Joseph Smith's first vision is an initiation or an endowment transforming an unaccomplished young man from an impoverished family into religious royalty as a seer and prophet. We argue here that Smith's first vision, facilitated by an entheogen, corresponds to similar royal entheogen-infused death and rebirth initiation rituals. Knight and Lomas from 1996 explain, quote, the new king would have undergone death by means of a potion administered to him by the high priest in the gathering of the inner group of the holders of the royal secrets. This drug would have been a hallucinogenic that slowly induced a catatonic state, leaving the new king as inert as a corpse. End quote. An entheogenic initiation of this nature would change the thoughts and feelings previously held by the new king. Two Book of Mormon narratives reflect entheogen-infused royal initiation rites discussed by Knight and Lomas. In the first narrative, after being chastised for unrighteousness, quote, The king fell unto the earth as if he were dead for the space of two days under the power of God, and the light which did light up his mind had infused such joy into his soul. And similarly, the queen then arose and cried, O blessed Jesus, clasping her hands, being filled with joy, end quote. In the second narrative, the son of a prophet king, unprepared to succeed him on the throne, is reprimanded by his father. In this account, the son reported, quote, I fell to the earth, and it was for the space of three days and three nights that I could not open my mouth, neither had I the use of my limbs. I thought that I could become extinct, both of soul and body. After three days and three nights, I cried within my heart, O oh, Jesus, thou son of God, have mercy on me. And when I thought this... I was harrowed up by the memory of my sins no more, and oh, what joy and what marvelous light I did behold! Yea, my soul was filled with joy as exceeding as was my pain. End quote. These remarkable narratives in the Book of Mormon parallel the first vision accounts given by Joseph Smith, supporting the thesis that his first vision was an entheogen infused initiation. In his first vision, number one, Smith felt profound guilt and shame associated with his sin. Number two, he was in mortal fear of sudden destruction. Number three, when Smith came to himself, he was sprawling on his back and it was some time before his strength returned. And number four, 
Afterward, he had feelings of calmness and peace indescribable. We suggest that more than coincidence, Joseph Smith's first vision, the Book of Mormon death and rebirth accounts, parallel Knight and Lomas's entheogen-infused royal initiation rite. It seems reasonable to conclude that Smith's experience and the Book of Mormon accounts were related to esotericism and entheogens. Synesthesia One feature of visionary experiences reported in the Book of Mormon, synesthesia, the stimulation of one sense modality provoking sensation in another, strongly suggests the effect of an ingested entheogen. In the Book of Mormon, Joseph informs the convert that after ingesting the seed of the fruit of tree, they should expect it to feel a swelling within the chest followed by a swelling motions. After the onset of the swelling motions, Smith informed converts to expect the appearance of light that, quote, enlightens the understanding, so the mind doth begin to expand, end quote, i.e., experiences the desired psychedelic properties of the seed. This mind expansion is accompanied, according to Smith, by the taste of light, suggesting the phenomena of psychedelic-associated synesthesia, quote, when you feel these swelling motions, it beginneth to be delicious, ye have tasted this light. End quote. Two examples will be most relevant here Lehi's dream of the tree of life and Alma's parable of a seed that grows into a tree of life. Joseph Jr. inserts into the Book of Mormon a vision of an Edenic tree, its fruit, and upon ingesting it, the profound experience of the love of God, nearly identical to his father's Edenic vision in 1811. Another probable reference to synesthetic bodily symptoms in the text of the Book of Mormon appears in a parable by the prophet Alma, comparing God's word to a seed. The parable describes the cultivation of a plant from seed, ultimately to a full-grown tree revealed to be, like Lehi's, a tree of life bearing fruit. Quote, now we will compare the word unto a seed. Now if ye give place, that a seed may be planted in your heart, behold, if it be a true seed, or a good seed, if ye do not cast it out by your unbelief, that ye will resist the Spirit of the Lord, behold, it will begin to swell within your breasts, and when you feel these swelling motions, ye will begin to say within yourselves, It must needs be that this is a good seed, or that the world is good, for it beginneth to enlarge my soul, yea, it beginneth to enlighten my understanding, yea, it beginneth to be delicious to me. End quote. The effects of cultivating this seed expand the mind, enlarge the soul, stimulate the taste of light, and produce inexpressible joy and happiness. In these passages, Joseph Smith encapsulated the very meaning of the current meaning of psychedelic and entheogen. More importantly, at least as far as Joseph Smith is concerned, the reader of the Book of Mormon is invited in this passage to experience the same psychedelic or entheogenic enlightenment, synesthesia, and transformation as he had. Mood Elevation Descriptions of the visionary dreams of Joseph Smith's father and his first vision, his Indian visions, and early Mormon visions in Kirtland, Ohio, discussed below, manifest mood-elevating properties. The mood-elevating effects of entheogens are well established. Eventually, they will be one modality of managing a treatment-resistant depression. See articles in Winkleman and Sessa, circa 2019. The antidepressant effects of psychedelic experience suggest motivational salience for entheogen use throughout history and specifically in the Smith family to facilitate visionary experience and as antidepressants. Labar, 1947, observed that Native American peyote use in religious confessionals provided a primitive form of psychotherapy. Similarly, the mood-elevating sequelae of Joseph Smith's use of entheogens in early Mormon rituals and confessionals was practical psychotherapy for early Mormons, and likely unconscious salience for conversion to Mormonism and convert resilience during the hardships of Mormon diasporas. That's where we're going to leave off this section of reading through our paper from the Journal of Psychedelic Studies titled The Entheogenic Origins of Mormonism, A Working Hypothesis. Now, I know these episodes have been relatively long when compared to our regular historical timeline episodes, but the topic is obviously quite dense and requires this much detail to begin to introduce such massive concepts. And in many ways, 
this paper attempts to bring the fields of academia together where they've scarcely been conjoined before. The field of Mormon history is a rich and exciting field of academia, as is psychedelics research. But the two fields rarely have shared any ground upon which to cooperate. We feel the primary purpose of this paper is to introduce an interdisciplinary approach to Mormon history. Psychedelics researchers rarely study Mormon history, and the same is true of the inverse, which we feel is a disservice when the founding documents of Mormonism can help explain entheogenic origins to many world religions with less available documents, and the field of psychedelics can help explain previously inexplicable aspects of early Mormon history. There is shared ground where these fields can coexist. It just takes a relatively sizable treatise to do it. Therefore, I apologize if this and last episode isn't what you come to this show for, or you're bored with the topic, or you, you know maybe the topic just isn't up your alley of interest. So for those of you who are still here, there's still so much more to discuss, and the third episode of reading this paper was going to be the longest yet, as that show script is already four pages longer than these previous two episodes. However, part three will dive into the nitty-gritty of Kirtland-era visionary Mormonism, the evolution of visionary Mormonism in Nauvoo, and the legacy left behind by this entheogenic religion before finally drawing a short conclusion calling on more historians and scholars to seriously consider this aspect of Mormon history and to conduct their own research to add to the overall Smith entheogen theory, which is largely in its infant stages right now. I'm also going to say thank you to those of you who are listening all the way through these episodes and all of the very positive feedback we've received on the previous episode already. My being able to put these episodes out on Naked Mormonism feed has allowed not only time to travel to visit family during the holidays, but it's also opened up time to do other research into Mormon money in light of the recent revelations concerning Enzyme Peak Advisors and the church stockpiling $100 billion. So, if you want Mormon history, but you maybe aren't as interested in psychedelics in Mormon history, I'd encourage you to check out the latest episodes of Glass Box Podcast to really scratch that Mormon history itch and also to understand the recent media outrage in, of course, a much deeper context. But you know what? Thank you so much for listening and for lending me your ear. Take care, everybody. is produced with help of Julie Briscoe as social media manager, Brian Ziegenhagen as audio engineer, and Andrew Torres of the Law Offices of P. Andrew Torres in the Opening Arguments podcast as legal counsel. Music is written and performed by Jason Camo of a alaststateofmind.com and used with permission. Naked Mormonism is a production of Ground Gnomes, LLC, copyright 2019, all rights reserved.